really had three basic hypotheses run in the show here. And one of them is that the criollo, compared to the, typical, the breeds typically used, um, can, do a, can maintain body condition and weight um, throughout drought without supplemental feed or with less supplemental feed. So that goes back to lower input costs. Um, that they have an overall smaller environmental footprint on the rangeland themselves. And then also looking at grass-fed strategies and seeing the environmental footprint of that versus conventional beef production. And what, another important hypothesis is that they are equally or more profitable, or producing criollo is equally or more profitable as um, conventional beef production. Because if it's not profitable, it's really not viable. And so based on those three hypotheses, we have a bunch of research um, approaches that we're using to tackle each of those hypotheses. Good afternoon. My name is Rafael. Uh, I work here at the Hornet Experimental Range. Uh, my experience with the Criollo cattle come from South America. I was able to work with these cattle down there, so that's where we started having some idea of what we could do with these cattle here in the desert environment. Uh, what I'd like to talk about first is that the distribution of criollo, without saying any specific biotype, the criollo extends from the way down there, from the Tierra of Fuego down in Argentina, all the way up in the southwest of the United States, and now we have some going in California, and we even find some now in Canada. So uh, it's pretty extensive. It goes throughout the continent and throughout the Americas. So this is an animal that's been here for over 500 years. Uh, he's compared sometimes to the, the grazing distribution of buffalo. And so they've been on a natural system for a very long time. All these animals were introduced into what we call North America. These animals really came from the Iberian Peninsula. In the Iberian Peninsula, before Christ, the uh, Celtics had cattle then the Romans came in with the white cattle, and then in 744, the Moors invaded the Iberian Peninsula, and they brought cattle from Africa. These animals were then uh, put in areas in Spain where they're very low forage availability, very uh, dry areas, and they were also selected to come across with uh, the first uh, voyages as to provide towel and leather. It wasn't for meat purposes. Uh, Tallow and leather remain a, a priority throughout the Americas till basically to the early 1900s. So uh, no one was ever talking about Criollo being a beef animal. He was actually a, a work animal. He was used to pull wagons and carts. Throughout Mexico, the, their development came through first with Cortez when he went in to uh, conquer uh, Mexico, and that was in 1512. But the first group of animals were really in 1522, and they followed this yellow line. This is the Camino Real. The Camino Real runs right here, close to us, right here on the range. And actually, our name is called Jornada del Muerto. And the Jornada del uh, Muerto really means it came about because it took five days, a Jornada, five days, to cross this area without water. So many people would not make it, or animals would not make it. Cortes was one that came in in 1512 and then in 1522. He moved the first one of the first uh, group of cattle that were uh, considered to be a ranch of, of criollos in Tamaulipas. And these animals, uh, as you see in these lines, if you, uh, these animals went up to the Gulf Coast, into Texas, and then on to the uh, uh, Mid Plains. We had another group that came up with Oñate that went uh, from Chihuahua and went up up here to El Paso, here on the Camino Real, and went also to Santa Fe. And then we had Coronado in 1540 that came up towards uh, to, to the Sea of Cortez, and then came up that way, and came up right here by uh, Tucson and Tupac. And so, and also, his main destination at that time was uh, Santa Fe. Uh, animals that went into California really until 1697, and so they crossed from Sonora into what they call the, uh, the Loreto area of Baja California. We have uh, some major biotypes in the United States of the Criolla. We have what we call the Cracker Jacket here in Florida, which is a biotype. We have the Longhorn that we see, that we used to see here in the uh, the Great Plains and so forth, uh, with the cattle drives and so forth, that's what was being used at that time. Then we have the Chinapos, 
which are the ones in California, and they only grow to about so tall. So they're sometimes even confused with sheep and goats in those areas. And so, uh, but all these animals, uh, what shows with this animal is it's able to adapt to different environments and different elevations and different range conditions. Uh, the animal that we use is called Gagamori, and we do that so we can differentiate them from the Corriente. He's a very small animal that comes up from the upper elevations of the uh, Rocky Mountains, usually about 10,000 feet. Forage up there is very scarce, so they don't grow much, and they're a very hardy animal. So that's why they're used for rodeo, but it's really not a meat animal. The Raramuri is, we call him Raramuri because he comes from the Tarumala Indians in the Copper Canyon, in the area of Chihuahua. And so we named him after that, is that where we found him? And he comes from about 200 uh, meters above sea level, and it's relatively a hot area and kind of a tropical, human tropical area. And so this animal got to be a little bit bigger than what we see in the Korean. So uh, these animals that we're talking about are animals that are uh, about 800 pounds of maturity. We don't want to go very much bigger than that. Uh, we want to keep a small animal on the range. And then we have these animals that come out of the Copper Canyon without finding that they're really grouse. They have the capacity to grouse. And so that's something that we're finding very interesting here in the Texas uh, besides the other characteristics that uh, Sherry was talking about. Uh, basically, uh, these animals from the Copper Canyon, uh, they usually get to about uh, 30 months of age. They're over 1,100, 1,200 pounds. So right now we're really, uh, we have a market for those animals. Uh, we're working with other people that are doing crossbreeding with them. Uh, so ranchers here, uh, he's not here right now, but uh, you can talk to him later on, Cindy Poe and Rob Pollen. Uh, Rob is crossing uh, Criollo with uh, the Angus, Desert Angus, and he's getting, you know, 500 pound, 550, 600 pound uh, wieners. So you can switch to a lighter cow and still have heavy wieners to sell. Here we have the opportunity of doing the cow-calf operation, the grower operation, and the fattening operation all in the desert. And uh, we were trying to see what was the capacity of this animal and how he would work out here. So uh, we're only working with him in an extensive system. We're not trying to get into any type of intensive system. In the uh, desert, in semi-desert, I think we have to keep on extensive systems. And so we're pulling down fences and making pastures larger instead of the main trend nowadays of of making smaller pastures and a uh, little heavier grazing and with rotation. Here with rotation it may take 10 years to recuperate uh, one pasture. I've seen it here that it's taken 14 years. So uh, it's not quick and it's something that we really have to look at and be careful with. Uh, sometimes management of these animals can be a little bit uh, challenging, but at the same time I think that they're answering a big question of ours is distribution. The herd over here, and uh, those little calves were born in the last uh, four or five days. And uh, you see the mother cows with a couple of collars around their neck, and the calf with one little collar. Um, I think we've done a lot, uh, the Jornada has done a lot, and we have repeated elsewhere our uh, studies using GPS tracking to monitor how these cows use the landscape relative to the traditional breeds we, we, we typically use over here in, in ranches of the southwest and elsewhere. And one of the things we found consistently, we've repeated studies in different pastures, both breeds together, breeds separate, and so on and so forth. And one of the things we always find is that when the rangeland goes brown, the Criollo cows tend to range out farther and the British crossbreds tend to stick around closer to water, probably waiting for the feed, I don't know. But, but we've now repeated these uh, studies at a site in Mexico. We've just finished up a similar study at a site in Argentina. 
and, and with a slightly different type of Creole over there, and we see very similar patterns. Something that surprises us is the, what we call the behavioral plasticity of this animal. So it can adapt pretty quickly and train, change its foraging strategies to changes in the environment. And you know, as you, as you heard from Brandon this morning, we're, we're facing this sort of increasing variability and precipitation and so on and so forth. And having an animal that's kind of adapted is able to track that and adapt its behavior to that is, is uh, something we think is, is very important. Um, the second collar, the black collar on the cows and the little collar on the calves is what we call a proximity logger. That is basically a radio collar that logs every contact event of the mother and the calf. So anytime the calf comes within, say, three feet of the mother, the logger will uh, record that, will say at what time it happened and for how long were they close together. And so one of the things we wanted to know is if uh, Criollo cows walk farther because they are, well, the, the, the first thing we, I'll come back to that later, sorry, but because uh, do, do the calves constrain their ability less to walk farther away than calves of uh, British crossbreds? And that's why we got into this. And we find differences in the way mothers and calves relate in these animals versus uh, the British uh, crossbreeds. And so I can give you more details on that. But that, that's another little gadget that we're using. Um, of course, the other important thing that that uh, that we are measuring, and, and uh, uh, this is a study that's being conducted by my colleague Rick Estelle and, and Sherry Spiegel and Shilamia. We're, we're looking at diets, of course. We, we, we think these animals select different diets. They probably browse more, we, we hope and think. And so we're just concluding a three-year study and we'll be able to know a little bit more about that at the next corner. The reason why we're making you all stand in the sun is because the other thing we're looking at is whether uh, these cows that stand in the sun all day long uh, uh, respond differently to heat stress than our traditional British crossbreeds. And, and to study that, we're, we are, the, those collars, the collar with the bright tape on them, has a temperature sensor in there, but we're also uh, using uh, some other little devices to uh, track body temperature. So this is a this is what animal scientists call a cedar, and it's it's used to uh, basically implant hormones and synchronize the estrus of cows. And we use a clean one of these without any any hormones. You put it into the the vagina of the cow, and uh, we have a little this. I don't. You probably can't see this. There's a little tiny button here that's a temperature data logger. We put it in there, and uh, and we've tracked for two years during summer and winter body temperatures of uh, these and of British crossbreds and are close to analyzing that data. We think, we think there are differences. We think these cows, uh, what, what we see is that during uh, the hottest hours of the, of the day, they tend to hang out in bare ground areas. So they don't seem to be running to the shade. And our, our British crossbreds seem to uh, be more tied to the shade. All of these things are important because they determine how, what constraints an animal has on its, on its ability to decide where to go, where to move. And so,